Yeah, yeah it's not great. Uh, please, please start your presentation. Okay. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm going to give my status of embedded Linux talk. Uh, if you've been to a Jamboree before, I'm sure you've seen this talk before. But uh, I'll just go ahead and uh, get started. This is the version of the talk for May 2018. And uh, just a, a brief note on this, uh, nature of this talk is this is just a quick overview of lots of different topics. Uh, it's really intended to be a springboard for further research so that I don't go into anything in, in uh, depth. Uh, but hopefully if you see something interesting here, uh, you have a link or some terminology that you can use to search for that if you want to find out more information. I have a lot of links uh, to articles in the presentation. I should note that this is not a comprehensive uh, list of everything. Uh, this, uh, a lot of this is just stuff that I've seen and uh, as I've uh, been paying attention in the industry and with some of the organizations I'm involved with. So um, the major outline is this. I'll go through the kernel versions and then step through technology areas, talk a little bit about CD workgroup projects, uh, and then uh, go through some other miscellaneous stuff and give you some resources. So let's start with kernel versions. So here are the kernel versions that we've had in the last year. Um, so uh, from 4.12, that was released last year in July, uh, through 13, 14, 15, of course, had was a little bit longer. Uh, release cycle of 77 days, or 11 weeks rather than the normal uh, nine weeks that we usually do. Uh, but that was because of Spectre and Meltdown. And you notice that with 4.16, we got back on track with a, a nine-week uh, kernel release cycle. Uh, we're currently on 4.17 RC6. Uh, things are looking pretty good. So I would expect that we'll have another 63-day cycle. And uh, we should see that kernel uh, a week from Sunday. Uh, so that's all pretty good. Uh, just looking real quickly at some of the things that were in these different releases. I'm not, I, a lot of these slides uh, you've seen before, so I'm not going to focus on some of these older kernels from a year ago. Uh, but just really quickly, we see, saw some new block I.O. schedulers, uh, some work on the mini TTY uh, code. It doesn't look like that went anywhere, uh, so I don't, I don't think we're actually going to see uh, any of that mini TTY work. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be completed, but I, I could be wrong. Um, uh, there was proper support for USB Type-C connectors. There was a new analyzed boot tool uh, that reads D message and possibly the F trace logs and produces a nice graph of boot events. Uh, and you can see some links there if you want to go look at that. Um, in 4.13, we started to see the first parts of the uh, TLS transport layer security implementation inside the kernel, uh, which should help with HTTPS performance. Uh, we saw a next interrupt prediction f 2 fs support for disk quotas, and uh, we saw a case self test was transitioning to um, an output format called TAP13. Um, in 4.14, we had a new kernel stack unwinder. This actually caused some changes in the way the, uh, in some of the dependencies that the kernel had for, um, for building. Uh, it requires a, a later uh, version of GCC. SquashFS and ButterFS uh, added support for uh, Z standard or ZSTD uh, compression. So some more file system improvements in the area of compressed file systems. And there was better CPU-free coordination with uh, SMP. In 4.15, getting into the fall of last year, uh, we had CRAMFS support. Uh, uh, support for mapping persistent memory, uh, which is really good. So you could use persistent memory underneath CRAMFS. CRAMFS is a, is a version of RAMFS, uh, which is a memory-based file system. But uh, by allowing it to map onto persistent memory, you could use that for XIP or other, other types of things where the files were stored in a persistent fashion. Um, AMD, AMD Display Core system was accepted, so this is a very big GPU driver that got accepted into the mainline kernel. Uh, that was pretty big news. Uh, device Tree Compiler added support for overlays. There was RISC-V support added 
uh, to the kernel. Um, and then uh, the big news uh, in 4.15, actually, sorry, not last year, this is in January, it was when 4.15 came out. We had the Spectre and Meltdown mitigations uh, with uh, two, two really big features uh, called KPTI, kernel page table, uh, I don't know what the I is for. And then uh, Retpolines, which is a return trampolines, it's an abbreviation for that. And I talked a lot about those in my last uh, talk at the last Jamboree in March. Um, now, getting into kind of more modern stuff, so this is the kernel that was released, uh, let's see, when did 4.16, it's on my previous slide. 4.16 came out about uh, six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, and it has initial support for the jailhouse hypervisor. Uh, that's something that uh, uh, Siemens has been doing quite a bit of work on, a new hypervisor uh, that they're using in a lot of embedded systems. Uh, EVPF support for functions. So you can now add, uh, uh, currently, uh, when, you're, when you're adding uh, uh, EBPF, uh, EBPF stands for uh, Extended Berkeley Packet Filter, and it's a virtual machine in the kernel. Uh, you could write virtual machine code that could be injected into the kernel to do things like tracing or to do uh, network filtering. Uh, but it didn't, uh, surprisingly, it didn't have support for functions, and that's now been added. Uh, so that's uh, really handy. Um, and then uh, we saw some more mitigations for Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, we saw some specific to ARM64. We had seen a bunch of Intel ones in the 4.16, or 4.15 kernel. And now in 4.16, we saw uh, some of that same, so the same issues being addressed for ARM64. And then some general code to handle, with, handle specter mitigations. Uh, there's a new routine called array index no spec, which means no speculation. So it's a special uh, macro, I believe, that uh, allows you to reference arrays in a way that uh, prevents the, the processor, uh, no matter whether it's ARM or Intel or whatever, prevents the processor from doing speculation to prevent uh, uh, people from being able to uh, uh, maliciously read uh, values beyond the end of the array. Um, and then uh, high resolution timers now have two modes, uh, which allows them to run an interrupt context, which, uh, which should help somewhat with the real-time performance. Uh, another couple of things that are fairly specific to embedded, uh, F2FS had a lot of miscellaneous improvements, and I'll, when I get to file systems, I'll talk about some of the improvements that they had there. Uh, but uh, uh, and then Slimbus and Soundwire, uh, these are MIPI audio bus standards. Uh, they had whole subsystems added for those. I think that there was some driver support before, but now they're they actually have their own subsystems added. Um, and so that's that's good for embedded products uh, with, that are using those those audio standards. Uh, a new thing that actually hit me. <laughs> And I had to deal with it. Was uh, Flex and Bison are now required for kernel build. So in the Fuego test system that I'm working on, we have some automated uh, uh, routines that uh, that check for that do the do kernel builds, and and they stopped working on port at 16 because uh, we now have to integrate Flex and Bison. Uh, what happened was okay. So these are. Uh, these are the uh, free versions of Lex and Yak, which are compiler compilers. Uh, these are things used to build parsers. And uh, the parsing code had been pre-built and put into the kernel source tree, and now they don't pre-build it. They just give the original uh, description files into the kernel source. So, um, so that's something to look out, look out for. Uh, most uh, every uh, development computer that I'm aware of has Flex and Bison on it. The only reason that Fuego had a problem with this is because it's using a, a containerized uh, build system that, um, that didn't have all of the necessary development packages installed. Uh, now, getting into 4.17, of course, 4.17 is not actually out yet. It is uh, expected to land in about two weeks, but we've gone through the merge window, so we have a very good idea of uh, the types of things that are going to be in 4.17 or not going to be in 4.17, as this case may be. This very, very first thing is uh, the kernel has actually started to drop support for old architectures that appear to be unsupported. Uh, so we have Black, Blackfin, Chris, FRV, M32R, 
Maytag and MN10300 score tile, and I only I had only ever heard of like four of these, uh, uh, but they actually went ahead and removed the support for these. It removes about 460k lines of code, and it's only the third time ever uh, that a kernel release has shrunk in size in terms of number of total lines of code. Uh, so we're always adding, 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 but this release we actually uh, went down in size. Uh, there was a lot of uh, concern uh, about whether we should remove stuff from the kernel. A lot of times we just, even if someone, no one appears to be using it, we just let the code sit there uh, because it doesn't appear to have too much of an impact, but, but it really does have an impact. Uh, as kernel developers are developing new features, uh, they may run into things where they have to go and and uh, change an interface, and it may be affected, you know, by there may be cases in these architectures where people have to actually maintain code that actually no one is really using at all. And so, uh, uh, most of these uh, were known to be completely dead, no longer manufactured. A couple of these are still manufactured, uh, but seems to seems like either the developers are not really interested in using Linux uh, anymore, or um, or usually it's because they're using a lo much lower end RTOS. Uh, but in any event, uh, this code was deprecated, which does not mean that, uh, that you can't use Linux on these devices, you just can't use the current Linux. So if you had a, a 2.x version of Linux or a 3.x version of Linux that was running on a black bin, for instance, uh, you could still run that version of Linux, and and uh, so it just means that uh, you know Blackman won't be able to run the 5.x or 6.x. Um, and of course, if someone pops up and says they're willing to maintain something, uh, the kernel kernel developers can can always pull re pull something back in. There are actually a couple of other architectures. There were two or three others that were uh, almost removed, but uh, people spoke up and said, hey, we want to keep that in there. Um, so, okay, so another thing that happened in 4.17 was a rework of the kernel idle loop. I'll talk about that when I get to power management. Uh, we finished full in kernel TLS support. We had done, I think we had done the transmit side, but not the receive side or something, vice versa. Uh, so now, uh, we have TLS protocol support in the, in the kernel, full stack. Uh, that will be good for um, improving networking performance when you're using uh, uh, secure encrypted layers, uh, encrypted packets and stuff. Uh, we also have improved CPU load estimation. I'm going to talk more about that also. Uh, is that next? Yeah. Um, so improved CPU load estimation. Uh, so we, there's already load estimation in the kernel. There's something called per entity load tracking, uh, or PELT, uh, which is a mechanism in the kernel to keep track of uh, the load on the server. And this is used for power management, um, uh, to keep track of how much each process is using, to be able to migrate processes between CPUs, depending on the amount of processor they're using, and to go into deeper sleep states, um, uh, but it was found uh, that PELT, or PELT, decays the load information about the processes too quickly. And so they've now got a new load estimator uh, in the system uh, that basically is just a variation on PELT. They didn't actually remove PELT. They uh, just added some, uh, some uh, new, new code to, to save the values when, when a system, when a process goes non-runnable, uh, when it stops running, uh, the PELT would actually decay its load information over time, even though when you restart the process, when it starts running again, it's going to be running at about the same load it was before it, before it stopped. And so this new estimator just avoids that decay. Uh, this means that the, the load estimation can clamp to the correct value more quickly. Um, what this is really good for uh, is for mobile and embedded. Uh, specifically, when you've got lower end CPUs, uh, you can't afford to have kind of the wrong estimate of your load in order to manage your processes. And the same thing for mobile. Uh, it's how a lot of mobile's uh, devices are tied to frame rates of the devices. And uh, so they're kind of sensitive to small 
uh, changes in the amount of load on the system, you can end up dropping frames in video or, or in animations. And so uh, having correct load information is, is very helpful. It does add something in terms of scheduling overhead. Uh, and so it requires setting a bit to turn it on. Uh, but, um, but in order to get that kind of smoother performance uh, it's, uh, and better, better power management, it seems like it's uh, worth it. Uh, so this is something that went into 4.17 and will be available to people when that uh, kernel comes out. Uh, the other thing, kind of really interesting thing in 4.17 uh, was there's now a formal kernel memory ordering model. Okay, so there's a document that describes exactly how the memory ordering model of the kernel works. Kernel is very, very complicated uh, because it's got uh, something called RCU read copy update uh, where a lot of things can happen out of order in the kernel, or not kind of the traditional expected order. And so they produced a document that says, well, this is how the, it's exactly how it's supposed to work. And then it's exact enough that they're able to write some formal proofs and some tests. And so they now have some testing code. It's, uh, the testing code is in its infancy. Uh, it's pretty new. Uh, but it actually will do a formal verification at the source code level uh, that the code uh, adheres to the memory ordering model. So this is, to my knowledge, this is the first time that we've had formal proofs of, uh, of code correctness in, in the kernel. Um, so that's, that's really interesting, I think. I think it shows the direction the kernel is heading in terms of uh, quality. Uh, also, a couple of things on x86, but I think I, the reason I include them, even though uh, this is mostly embedded uh, uh, in terms of the jamboree, is that uh, I think whatever what when stuff shows up on S eighty six, it's it's soon to show up on other platforms as well. So right now, the kernel build now requires GCC four point five or later. Uh, so used to be you could build the kernel with older compilers, uh, but they're kind of updating that. And GCC itself is not four point five is not that new of a compiler. That's fairly old, a couple of years of these. Uh, but also, uh, something happened, uh, they changed the system call uh, implementation on x86, and that was to um, uh, make it easier um, easier to modify and easier to maintain some of the system calls. So uh, some of the things that they've done on x86, I wouldn't be surprised if they keep working on those and change things in um, on other platforms, ARM be the next one. Okay, so that's it for kernel versions. So now I'm going to go through technologies area, technology areas. And uh, as you know, I, I've given this talk a lot, and you can go back to look at previous jamborees or previous uh, conferences where I've given the talk, and you can look up some of my old information. Um, in this, in this, uh, so I'm going to go. Some of these slides, there. It turned out there were not a whole lot of changes uh, to, you know, no, no, not a lot of new developments. Uh, but I left some material in. I'll kind of go over those slides rapidly. Uh, but I do want to just kind of go through the list of uh, technology areas that I think are interesting for embedded developers. So first is boot up time. These are actually alphabetical. So there's not a lot new here. There's nothing new that I could see that was added. Uh, the, only, the only new thing in the last year was almost a full year ago, and that was the Analyze Boot tool for analyzing boot up time. Uh, but you can still go back and look at uh, some of these talks that were pretty good, talking about how to do boot, uh, work on boot time, uh, different methods and techniques. Oh. And um, let's see. Next up is oops is yeah is device tree. Uh, so there's nothing new here. Again, there was a device tree boff, uh, birds of a feather session at ELC. But I don't think there's a whole lot of new stuff going on here. Uh, they're still talking about device tree validation. They're still talking about the updated device tree specification. Um, and uh, neither of those seem to be making a whole lot of progress. Uh, or if they are making progress, it's quite slow. Uh, the, thing that, what, the thing that does have, uh, does, has made some progress, I mean, is uh, with the overlays. So the device tree compiler added support for overlays. And overlays are used when you have a, a like a development board, which you can put different daughter boards on, and uh, so you can you can have a base device tree, 
uh, blob, and then you can augment that with an overlay that's specific for a daughter board. So that's very handy for things like the BeagleBone or, or a Raspberry Pi or uh, something like that uh, to make it easier to deal with those. And that, that seems to be going along okay. Um, let's see, in terms of file systems, uh, most, a lot of embedded systems, uh, you know, have switched over from NAND flash uh, to um, to regular block-based file systems. They they may be implemented in NAND, but they're they're coming from EMCC uh, and uh, EMMC rather. Um, but uh, so. So there's not a lot of news in the NAND flash area, like you with UBIFS or or some of the older file systems. But some of the existing file systems uh, are specifically geared for embedded or mobile applications. One of those is F2FS, the uh, uh, Flash 2 file system, and it continues to get developed. So this was developed primarily by um, I think it was Samsung. Anyway, uh, but uh, and it was primarily developed for Android. So it, in the 4.17 release, it received a whole lot of fix-ups. Uh, in particular, it have, now has something called lost and found support, uh, which means that if you run a, um, a file system check operation on it and orphan files are found, they are put into a special directory where they can be salvaged. Uh, it's got better tuning for a lot of low-end devices, uh, and there's a whole kind of long list of kind of miscellaneous uh, odd things, but it just shows you that the F2FS is getting more and more secure. Uh, in pre previous releases, 4.13 and 4.15, they added support for disk quotas. Um, and so it's a, it's a, essentially it's now become a very mature supported operating uh, file system uh, among all the others uh, that are supported by Linux. And then, uh, the other kind of news in the last year was ButterFS and SquashFS support for uh, a new compression algorithm. So the new compression algorithm is called ZSTD. Uh, it's faster and smaller in terms of its compression and decompression. And you can read more about uh, some of the stats for that. Ferronix is a site um, that does a lot of benchmarking, and they they take a really close look at a lot of these things to and have pretty good pretty good information on uh, what the trade-offs are in terms of the uh, compression size uh, versus um, the speed and, and that type of thing of the different different compression systems that are available for the file systems. Uh, in terms of graphics, uh, I'm not really, I don't know a whole lot about graphics. Uh, I did, there wasn't really a graphics talk or, or much information uh, at ELC this year. Uh, at Linux Comp Australia, uh, there was a talk on virtual reality that was pretty interesting by Hugh Packard. Uh, so there are there are people working on, and I know that people are working on uh, Vulkan, uh, which is um, kind of the successor to OpenGL. Uh, and so uh, there are things going on, but I'm I'm not super aware of them. Um, in terms of graphics drivers, uh, GPU drivers, I used to have a big long page here talking about all the different uh, uh, GPUs and what their driver status was. Uh, but Robert Foss uh, gave a whole talk on this subject at, uh, at ELC and, and uh, basically he went through each of the different GPUs and kind of where they stood and what their, what their timelines were. Uh, he, he did have some slides that are available on the, on the presentations page for ELC, but that's you have to, they don't have very much text. Uh, you kind of have to go watch the video. Uh, but anyway, the bottom line is that uh, NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, Broadcom, Qualcomm, and Vivante all have some form of upstream support. Um, a lot of it is by, uh, some of it is by the vendors themselves. Uh, some of it is by uh, volunteers and open source community. It's a varying quality. Uh, <clears throat> the one holdout for a long time has been ARM, but actually some stuff uh, is happening recently with the Molly T series. Uh, so there actually is some, some code that's available. It's not upstream yet, uh, but that's a little bit of movement there uh, from the status before. Uh, let's see. Now, in the area of networking, um, 
I don't know of a lot of, uh, I mean, there's a lot of high-end networking stuff going on. I don't really pay too much attention to that. In terms of uh, uh, networking related to uh, embedded, uh, we have uh, Bluetooth 5 has been supported for a while. There's a, a big push uh, that I've seen just in the last year to do uh, time-sensitive networking. And uh, this seems to be really, really important for, um, actually, for automotive. Um, and I think it has to do with uh, um, self-driving cars. So there's a, there's a, there obviously there's networks in the car um, or devices are being controlled and, and uh, so there's a real big emphasis on making sure that you can do real time over those networks, that you can maintain some real time uh, performance. And so there was actually, there was a talk at ELC Europe uh, in the fall and another one uh, this one at ELC 2018 was actually uh, quite good at giving an overview of the different uh, areas that are being worked on. And, and uh, But anyway, um, there's a lot of work going on in, in Linux around time-sensitive networking. Um, <clears throat> in kernel power, power management, uh, one of the big things was a rework of the kernel idle loop. Um, and I don't know, I have to admit, I don't know exactly what they did here. Uh, uh, it was a little bit too hard for me to follow, but the idea is that you prevent CPUs from spending too much time in shallow idle states. And so I think, I um, can't remember the exact mechanism they were using, but the effect in 4.17 was that it reduces idle power on some systems by about 10%. So that's when the system is idling, your power, to, power consumption goes down. Uh, and then even when you have some workloads, you're getting uh, some performance performance and some power management benefits. And there are some really good charts and graphs at Peronix uh, talking about the, or showing how much performance. So this is really good uh, for, for uh, power. Um, the other thing uh, in power management is people are still working on the scheduler. Uh, so there's uh, something in the kernel called the energy aware scheduler. This is kind of the successor this is, this is the name of what they used to call uh, the big dot little scheduler. There are a couple of different ways that you can construct, um, that you can manage the scheduling, but the, the new popular thing, uh, especially in the mobile space, is to have heterogeneous CPU, uh, CPU. So you have a, a bank of uh, uh, low-end CPUs, a bank of faster, higher-end CPUs, and there's, a, there's quite a it's quite a challenge to make sure that you put your workloads on the appropriate CPUs to use the least amount of energy possible. Um, that's called a big dot little design. Anyway, Qualcomm, uh, so the kernel has an energy aware scheduler, uh, and Qualcomm, though, didn't like it very much, and they actually wrote their own big dot little scheduler called QHMP, and, uh, and it actually, for Android workloads and for other things, it actually was doing better than EAS in some regards. Uh, uh, and so uh, Vitaly Wool and others took a look at it, and uh, it's clear that Qualcomm did not really attempt to get the code mainlined. It was very messy code, and it's uh, got some weird things in it. But there, it does have some useful features. Um, so uh, I guess people are looking now at uh, looking at QHMP and some of the ways that it does stuff and seeing if those uh, features can be adopted into the, the in-kernel uh, energy aware scheduler, EAS. Uh, so that's something to, to look for in the future. Now, in real time, uh, the RT preamp patches uh, are giving good real time performance. That's actually been true for quite a long time, but I think it's, it's good to remind people of that. The RT preamp patch is still out of tree. Uh, it's got... Uh, Last time I talked to um, Thomas Gleichner, who's the who's the main main guy developing RT preempt, um, I think he said something like about 40k, 40,000 lines of code out of tree. But but uh, this stuff issues keep coming up. So what, what last time I checked with him, the last thing he told me was there's hot plug blocking. Uh, they got some timer wheel rework they got to do. Uh, the de-entry cache. Uh, locking, and it turns out that a lot of work still goes into maintaining these RT trees uh, that are out of mainline. 
so they don't they don't produce a version of the RT preamp patch for every kernel. Uh, they don't support every kernel release. They're currently focused on supporting uh, the kernel long-term stable releases, uh, and they actually have to have several different maintainers because they're maintaining. You have to continue to maintain that tree as uh, as those LTS trees get updated. So as stuff stuff gets backported in terms of fixes, you have to maintain the RT tree. So they have an incentive to try and get this stuff upstream, and they're continuing to work on it, but it's an ongoing process. Um, if you look at, uh, there are a whole bunch of presentations on real time at ELC. Uh, one of them was on ZMI, which is the alternative to RT preempt, which is the dual dual kernel approach. Um, Sandra Capri gave an interesting session, uh, a kind of real time Linux, uh, how to get as much RT performance as you can without using the preempt RT patches, just using a vanilla kernel, some of the techniques you might use for that. Um, and then uh, uh, Taejun Chen uh, talked about uh, some of the performance uh, of preempt RT on a Raspberry Pi. So that's a, a suitably kind of embedded ish processor, and uh, it really does work pretty well. Um, and then Steve Rostet talked about uh, some of the main maintenance issues with their real-time kernel. Um, so those are worth looking at if you're interested in real-time. In terms of security, uh, I talked last time uh, I gave this talk, I talked quite a bit about Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, and so I don't, I'm not going to kind of revisit all that. But basically, these huge, big uh, vulnerabilities that were found um, in all processors, uh, but uh, the Meltdown was worse, was, was kind of the had a really, really big problem on Intel processors, and so Intel took a big hit there and had to do a lot of scrambling. And the whole whole community did a lot of scrambling uh, on this very, very severe problem. Um, but I think it's actually worked out OK. Um, now, having said that we addressed Spectre and Meltdown, of course, some new Spectre variants have been found in the last couple months. So there's a new one called Variant 3A, uh, which is called Rogue System Register Read. And variant four, which is speculative store bypass, and you can go find these online and, and look up all the details. This is not, un unfortunately, this is not a surprise at all. When when Spectre and Meltdown were announced, uh, we were told uh, that you these are kind of a new class of vulnerabilities, and we're just getting started. And so we were expecting new variations of uh, of these types of vulnerabilities, speculative execution vulnerabilities. Uh, would be discovered. And so they have been. And I think we'll continue to see a stream of these as people uh, figure out how dangerous speculative execution actually is. Uh, but we're not going to give it up because it's too important in terms of speed. So uh, I think we'll continue to see kind of this rolling uh, set of vulnerabilities that are announced. Uh, there are fixes for variant 3 a and 4 already in the pipeline. So there are kernel patches that you can get, and there's microcode updates, uh, at least for Intel processors. So these are security flaws. They're fairly serious, uh, but they can be dealt with. And to my knowledge, nobody, um, we haven't actually seen these used, although it's, it would be hard to know if they were used. Uh, but anyway, um, so a couple of secure presentations from the last couple conferences. Uh, people have focused on, uh, there are other aspects of security besides just the CPU vulnerabilities. Uh, there's file system security, so there is a talk on security features for UBIFS. And then there's the kind of the booting chain of trust. Uh, there's a good uh, presentation by Clinton Schultz and Mylene Josrand talking about all the different techniques and issues involved with secure boot. Um, how to make sure that you're running the kernel and the modules and ultimately the applications that uh, that are safe and trusted uh, on your system, um, which is actually a, one of the ways you can mitigate. Uh, a lot of these vulnerabilities require that you run untrusted code. Um, okay, so in moving on to system size, so there's no new kernel features. Uh, uh, there was. A, so, but there's the same kind of techniques that are still available if you are working on a very small footprint system. Uh, there was a BOF, Embedded Linux Size BOF, by Michael Obdenacker. Um, it's kind of a repeat of the one he did in the fall, but it's uh, still got a great overview. He's got the slides online. You can go look those up. 
uh, if you're working on a system that where you need to shave your size down. And then also Pokey Tiny. Uh, I didn't realize Pokey Tiny is actually pretty old now. It's about six years old. It's a it's a distribution that's included in the Octo project. Well, it's not included. It's an add-on to the Octo project. There's a layer you can go get. And um, so if you want to build a very minimal system, uh, this one has reduced uh, a reduced package list and uh, the package sizes are kind of configured for small size. Uh, so it's interesting. Scott Murray gave um, talked about uh, some of the size over time over the different releases, and it hasn't grown that lot that big. If you if you continue to use uh, smaller things, you can get a system down about two and a half meg, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, at least two and a half meg of code. I'm not sure. It's probably four meg of RAM is what's required to run it. Um, so it's possible to do size stuff, but not not a lot of new features are going into the kernel right now. For size. Now testing. Uh, there's a whole whole bunch of stuff going on with testing. Uh, this section is probably bigger than it should be because I'm personally involved in testing. Uh, but just really quickly, uh, case self test. Not a lot of news new information here. This is the system inside the kernel source tree uh, for doing unit testing. Uh, we just continue to see um, things added to KSELF test, and KSELF is, is being used by lots of different harnesses to test the kernel, uh, which is good. So everything that gets added to it is ends up being run in lots of people's labs, including Fuego labs and kernel CI labs and LKFT labs. So Fuego uh, is the test framework that I've been working on uh, a lot. And uh, we just had the 1.3 release just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we have more report output formats, including Excel, HTML, PDF. Uh, we have uh, hardware board control that we're supporting and the ability to test phase execution. Uh, means you can run both parts of a test uh, is good for debugging the test and also uh, for other reasons that are too long to get into here. But tests are being added on a consistent basis. And the 1.3 release, we had 18 new tests. Uh, uh, that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's that's 18 new kind of uh, test programs or test suites. So uh, some of those, uh, like one of those was the Vols added. Uh, I don't know, upwards of a thousand individual test cases. Um, so there's a bunch of real-time tests that were added this release, and and we continue expanding uh, Fuego and making it useful. Uh, so there's a presentation I gave uh, in December, uh, but also up, upcoming at Automotive Linux Summit, I'll be giving another presentation on the much more detail on the status of Fuego. Uh, KernelCI.org. Kim, I think it's yeah. worth uh, making some of the appeal. Uh, I think they mentioned about uh, upcoming your visit to Tokyo along with the uh, Fuego, uh, you know, uh, mini jamboree. Yes, I uh, have that in some slides later. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, yes, I, I agree. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and we'll get to them here probably pretty shortly. So. Um, KernelCI.org does continuous build and boot testing. It's a very successful project. Um, and they are actually working on creating a project in the Linux Foundation. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later uh, when I get to trade association stuff. But uh, this project is continuing to go strong. And uh, there's actually a new test project that I was not aware of. So everybody knows that Lenaro had done um, Lava which is kind of a, the low end of the test framework. Uh, and then uh, that they did a lot of support for kernel CI, which is build and boot testing. So Lenaro has also done a new thing called LKFT, which is Learn Linux Kernel Functional Testing. So this is a relatively new Lenaro testing effort. Uh, I think it's actually been around for about a year, but I only heard about it uh, recently. Uh, it's focused on functional testing as opposed to build and boot testing. So you can test the kernel. Uh, but also a distribution, and it's also focused on embedded devices, which makes it different. So it actually um, uh, very similar in goals in terms of results to Fuego. Um, but anyway, there was a presentation on LKFT uh, by Thomas Gall of Lenaro at uh, ELC, and you can take a look at that. 
Actually, I'm, we're hoping to have a meeting with uh, a bunch of people from these different uh, test things. I'll talk about that later as well. Uh, the final thing with testing, I told you the section was too, was too long, is uh, there was a big discussion on the kernel, uh, the K-Summit discussion list. So sometimes, um, uh, so there's a discussion list called K-Summit Discuss, and it's for when, it's for issues that people want to discuss at the kernel summit. Uh, but sometimes the threads get really, really long, and instead of discussing at the summit, they hash all the issues out on the, on the mailing list anyway. Uh, one of the issues that came up was uh, a lot of this automated testing of the kernel, and in particular that Linux Next, which is the tree which is used to integrate uh, all of the different uh, feature trees uh, during the kernel release cycle, uh, it's very hard to test because things keep breaking. You know, things. The, the whole reason that we have Next is so that uh, we can test the integration of the different uh, trees. There's like 300 uh, trees for different subsystems in the kernel. And so they all get put into Linux Next, and then they, they kind of iron out their um, their conflicts before we get to the merge window. But the problem is that it's, stuff is broken all the time. And so automated testing has a really hard time with that. So you can't, you can't rely on people doing manual work uh, in an automated testing thing. So Stephen Rothwell, that, there was a long discussion thread, but basically the result was that Stephen Rothwell has created a new version of the next tree that just has the fixes branches for all the different things. So it turns out that um, every developer for Linux has kind of two trees. They have their next tree, but they also have a fixes tree, which they're working on in parallel, which which has stuff that they're going to put into the release. But um, anyway, it's kind of hard to describe. But basically, it's a whole set of things, and it's just strictly related to bug fixes. It's, it's not their features that they're going to add. Uh, anyway, so the result is that Stephen Rockwell has set up a new tree uh, that should make it easier to automatically test the next branch. Uh, so it should not break automated testing breaks. And so the idea is that uh, with more automation in the next branch, we'll get even more uh, testing of uh, a lot of the fixes, in particular the stable fixes, uh, the fixes that are going into long-term stable releases. Those will get testing a lot more uh, than they have been. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, now, on the tool chains. So uh, one of the things that I was really interested in was uh, I saw this article on GCC 8, and it's going to have a uh, whole bunch of usability improvements. Mm -hmm. And by usability, uh, I mean the compiler, you, you, there's only two aspects of usability, how you run it and what it tells you. And so this has to do with what it tells you. Um, so it's going to provide much better messages for some errors. I don't know if, if when you're using GCC, a lot of times you get these error messages, and it's really hard to figure out what they mean or what they're talking about. Uh, but the, they've done a big effort to improve the error messages. Uh, so instead of saying something like, well, you'd have to go look at this article to, to get some of the examples, the, the, one, the one at the very bottom, the, developers read, the Red Hat Developers Blog article. But basically, um, you know, it'll actually tell you if you're missing a semicolon instead of giving you some weird error about, you know, oh, I, you know, I was expecting something else before this brace. Um, anyway, and then the other thing is that besides the error message being a lot better, it shows you it, it does a better job of finding the, the actual line where the error occurred. Uh, in some cases, it will show fix it hints. Uh, and what that means is it'll actually tell you what you need to do to fix the code. So, like, if you're missing a semicolon, it'll say, in, instead of the weird message it had before, it'll say, you're missing a semicolon. By the way, here's what you could do. You could put the semicolon right here. And uh, it actually out, it can be made to output that fix-it hint in a format that can be automatically processed. So it can, you can actually get it to emit a patch that you could then automatically apply. Um, so that's actually pretty neat. So instead of, instead of just telling you you're missing a semicolon, it can give you a patch to, to put the semicolon in for you. Um, it also does other things uh, this, which are which are fairly interesting. So, like it, it can detect missing include files. So a lot of times uh, you get something and it just says, "Oh, this is undefined." It's like, well, okay, well that's great, but now I got to go figure out what include files to put in my source. Uh, and it now 
it will actually figure that out. It will scan the source for you and, and figure out uh, what include file has that thing that was not defined. Uh, so it makes it much, much easier uh, to fix your bugs. So it should be a real time saver. So I'm pretty excited about this. I haven't started using it yet myself. Uh, I'm not doing a whole lot of kernel coding these days, but uh, but in any event, this is, uh, this is pretty good stuff. The other thing on the tool chain was something that was announced at uh, Embedded Linux Conference. Uh, it's pretty interesting. So uh, this is kind of IoT stuff, but it's related to Embedded Linux. So there's a there's a developer tool called Arduino Create, and uh, this tool is is made to take Arduino sketches, which are essentially Arduino programs, and uh, develop them. And uh, it's, it's basically an IDE for working with uh, uh, Arduino boards. Uh, but they've actually extended it to now that you, you can use that same tool to work with embedded Linux boards. And in particular, uh, devices like the BeagleBone and the Raspberry Pi uh, can run essentially an, Ar uh, an Arduino sketch. And it can be delivered through the cloud. So that's very, very convenient. If you're doing it for particularly for someone doing something with IoT or for low-end kind of custom embedded, very, very simple, uh, uh, easy mechanisms for developing, you know, small programs that just toggle some PPIOs or, or, or you know, read sensors and do those types of things. Uh, very easy to develop those now uh, in the cloud and actually deploy them to the devices. So, uh, and you can actually see, um, see more about this announcement that was done uh, at ELC uh, 2018. There was a lot of excitement uh, when this announcement was really made. Uh, let's see, tracing. Yeah, and so this is my last uh, slide on the different uh, technology areas. So tracing, there's not, there's not a whole lot new here, except for that ability to create a, a function uh, at runtime. Um, and so uh, that's about it. Uh, for for all those different functional areas. So now I'm going to cover just a few miscellaneous items, and, and then we'll move on to the next major thing. So uh, a couple of things. Your 2038 work, um, well, you can see these. I'll, I'll just talk about each of these. So there was an, a status update that was sent out by Arne Bergman, who's doing most of the work this, for this in the kernel. Uh, there are lots of small driver fixes that were in 4.16. Uh, and there was lots of changes to the system call entry points uh, for uh, timekeeping related syscalls. Uh, the main thing has to do with uh, altering the structures to support new 64-bit timestamps, but a lot of those patches have already been submitted for a lot of drivers. Uh, they still need some work converting some structures over in the uh, virtual file system layer. Uh, and there's actually a lot of stuff intended to land in 4.18. So, the merge window, which is coming up here in about two weeks, we should see quite a bit of uh, 2038 work in that. Um, so continue to make the kernel say uh, a good 20 years ahead of when it's needed. But uh, anyway, that's good. We'll get these problems ironed out so that if we have a, a product that goes, you get some embedded device that's going to last for 20 years, it won't fall over in 2038. Uh, free RTOS uh, license was changed to the MIT license. It used to be GPL with some weird clauses, uh, but it was uh, basically it was acquired by Amazon, and they've released it with an MIT license. So that's that's kind of interesting. That's uh, kind of a big change in the RTOS space. That's not really a, a embedded Linux thing, but it's, uh, it does change the operating system landscape a bit when, a, when you see a license change like that. Uh, this is also not strictly Linux, but there's a new Git protocol version uh, version 2 of the Git protocol uh, does uh, much better performance, uh, which is actually a pretty big, pretty big deal. Um, those of us who use Git on a daily basis, especially pushing and pulling to large repositories, uh, Google has been doing the work on this. They have a three times performance improvement uh, for certain types of fetches on repositories containing, containing 500k references, and an eight, eight times reduction of the overhead of bytes sent from the server. And it's because of they're just doing filtering better on the, the references and the things that go across the protocol. So if you do a lot of Git pushes and pulls, you'll and you migrate to 
version 2 and your server is using version 2, uh, then uh, you'll see some big performance improvements. So that, that'll be really good. Uh, that's actually pretty interesting. Um, let's see, another thing is Android kernel status. Uh, continue to make progress. Uh, Lenaro is doing a lot of work uh, to reduce the, the delta between stock Android, Android common kernel and uh, the long-term stable kernel that it's based on. Um, in particular, uh, just uh, there was a talk by Amil Pundar uh, talking about the Android kernel and how much is still out of tree. It's about right now. It's about uh, forty-one thousand changes, uh, or forty-one thousand lines of changes. Sorry, uh, forty-one thousand lines, which is not that big uh, compared to years ago. Now this is not inside a product, so this is just the this is Google's patches, to Android. You still have the semiconductor vendors uh, patches for their SOC, uh, but Google is getting closer and closer with their uh, their common Android things. So the things that are still out of tree uh, are the SD card, a lot of SD card code, net filter, energy aware scheduling, uh, and some USB gadget stuff. And there's a lot of there's a long tail. There's a lot of miscellaneous stuff. Uh, but Lenaro is actually tracking this closely. Uh, they're measuring for each release, and they've been trying to port, forward port these Android common patches up to the latest mainline. And so that actually is a really useful to get this stuff upstream. Um, okay, so now CE workgroup projects. Um, these are kind of the four main CE workgroup projects. And I don't know a lot about what's going on with them, so I'm going to go over these really quickly, except for Fuego. Uh, but we have the shared embedded distribution, LTSI, Fuego, and the Elinx Wiki. So the shared embedded distribution, as far as I know, that's going, that's going OK. I saw some articles that were talking about uh, using it. Um, I think it was Mark Charlevoix gave a talk, uh, a Qualcomm guy gave a talk about using Debbie on, uh, on a 410C board, so uh, it's getting some exposure out there. Uh, the LTSI initiative uh, continues to go along, although um, it's not a whole lot, uh, well, I mean, we haven't done a, re a release yet. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the status is on the next release, the 4.14 release. Uh, but a lot of the industry is focused on using LTS or LTSI, and um, you can see a presentation by Shabbat-Hassan uh, at ELC Europe on this. Uh, just in terms of long-term stable, uh, we have, this is now a big fixture, a big important part, I think, of kind of the whole release cycle of the kernel are these long-term stable releases. And uh, this is, uh, for, especially for products that are going to ma be maintained over a long period of time, uh, this is really important. The big news uh, in the last year was that Greg Kohartman said he was going to maintain the 4.4 kernel for an extra long time. So notice that its date is way out there, February 20, uh, of 2022, which is good six years. Um, and that's, uh, that's actually the kernel that the CIP system has decided they're going to also maintain. So Greg will probably not be the maintainer for that long. It will probably be handed over to Ben Hutchings uh, as soon as he gets to the end of life of that. But um, or his end of life, which is closer to two years. But it, it does show that the, uh, that the kernel community is very serious about giving long-term maintenance. And so we'll see how this, this comes out. We don't know when the next super long-term kernel will be. Uh, the two-year long-term stable kernels have been coming out about once a year. Um, and so we'll see. And you can see the projected end of life dates on those. Uh, ben Hutchings is still maintaining 3.16 all the way through for another uh, another two years, about. Um, let's see. So the Fuego test framework, I already talked about uh, the features in the 1.3 release and some of the work going on there. But uh, uh, one interesting thing that was funded by the CE Linux project um, or the core embedded Linux project is a, a Fuego self-test. And Fuego, that work was completed actually just recently. Uh, Fuego now has an integrated release test. So this is this is really interesting. It's a, it's a Fuego job that will build the Fuego Docker container from scratch and actually test it. So it runs, it's a test of Fuego in Fuego. Uh, that actually turned out to be kind of a tricky thing to do. Uh, but the, 
the really neat thing is not so much that Fuego can test itself. That's that's really good for me as the Fuego maintainer. Uh, but for other Fuego users um, who aren't doing Fuego release testing, it, this test ended up adding some stuff to the base Fuego distribution. Uh, so we added Selenium and Chromium, and and so we now have the capability to do uh, web web based uh, testing and image-based testing. So you can take snapshots of a screen interface uh, and compare the snapshots. And uh, this is uh, this is getting out of just the standard, you know, comparison text type of testing. Uh, another thing I'd like to add in the future is some audio uh, testing. But uh, but you know, be able to test web and images and audio would be really really big step forward in terms of the capability of Fuego. And so we've added kind of the initial steps for that. This work was completed by Profusion recently. Uh, and then the eLinux wiki, uh, we continue to use that uh, for a lot of things. There's tons of material out there. Some of the stuff that's been put out there recently, the board farm and automated testing pages, there's a lot of information that's gone out there. Uh, there's a lot of Renesas board information. Uh, there is uh, some developer guidelines. We're trying to collect uh, different pieces of information that are useful for uh, kernel developers. And uh, community doc translation pages. So there's uh, there's com community doc that's being translated into other languages. I know there's some Japanese uh, material out there uh, on that reference from that page. And then event pages. Obviously, we try to collect the the presentations and the videos for the presentations. Uh, so that's really handy. Um, then other stuff. So let me get to this is uh, we're we're winding down here. I promise I won't go past uh, 11:30. Um, so the Linux Foundation, the one thing I wanted to comment here, Linux Foundation is doing a lot of different things. I think they have over 70 or 80 projects now, including stuff that scan, uh, runs, it covers all different types of territories, blockchain and Kubernetes and I don't know. Um, but the one that I was really interested in is uh, uh, they are in the process of uh, developing a proposal for a kernel testing project. The bottom line of this is the simple story is that, it's um, a little bit more complicated than this, but the simple story is kernel CI developers uh, are working on getting a new hosting. So the project was kind of underfunded by Lenaro. Uh, the, there's a group of guys that have kind of been doing it on their own dime, uh, uh, using their own their own resources to fund it. But, it would, but it's a very valuable thing. It's found a lot of bugs. And it's kept a lot of platform booting uh, that otherwise would probably have not gotten uh, the attention they needed from upstream. Uh, so the project may expand in scope, uh, or it may not. Uh, but anyway, this is a proposal that uh, is kicking around. And, and uh, hopefully, uh, the goal is to get something set up by fall of this year. So we'll see what happens. Uh, in terms of conferences, uh, so we have the Embedded Linux conference that we just, well, just had. Two months ago we had it in March, and there's a ton of information. Uh, this this year we did a really good job of collecting the slides and videos. There's only one talk that I'm aware of uh, where the slides are not available, and I'm still, I'm still working with that presenter to get his. But we got videos of almost all the talks. There was one, there was one room where the video camera was not there, uh, so we missed three sessions. But other, but we did better at this conference than we have in other ones at getting all the presentations and videos collected up afterwards. Um, and then the Jam Japan Jamborees, of course, this is one of those, and we'll continue doing those throughout the year. Uh, the Open Source Summit Japan and Automotive Linux Summit are coming up in uh, Tokyo in June. And uh, this is the one that uh, uh, Wensan mentioned. We have a Fuego Jamboree, which is a special session of uh, and this is going to be on a Saturday, June 23rd, uh, over in Odaiba area, uh, and uh, especially for uh, people interested in Fuego. Uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, then in the fall, we have ELC Europe coming up with Scotland. And another event, uh, which uh, is the, this is the first instance of uh, this new event, and I don't know if it'll become annual or if it's something we just do at Plumbers or what, but we're having something called the Automated Testing Summit. And uh, so the Jamboree in June is specific to Fuego. This Automated Testing Summit is intended to be a gathering of all of the different people who are doing, who are doing testing. So I know that uh, 
the Colonel CI guys are going to be there. Uh, the LKFT guys, people from Lenaro, the Lava guys are going to be there. Uh, or they've said that they're interested. So, um, you know, Modulo, their travel plans and availability and stuff. But uh, I have a lot of people expressing interest in getting together and talking about um, a lot of uh, things with automated uh, testing of the kernel and, and Linux systems. Uh, so that will also be in Scotland. Um, oh, legal issues. Uh, this one was interesting, so I just had to throw it in here. So uh, if you are following kind of what's going on legally with Linux, you know that uh, there's a developer named Patrick McCarty who's been uh, doing lawsuits against people. And uh, anyway, um, he's been having some success and made some money. There's speculation that he's made about 2 million euros uh, with, his, with his lawsuits. People in the community are not very happy with kind of his approach. Uh, but this was big news. I don't remember, I think this happened in April, uh, that uh, Patrick McCarty actually withdrew his lawsuit against a company in Germany, uh, Jetia Tech. Uh, Jetia Tech fought back against his, uh, his lawsuit with some pretty good arguments. Um, the, they, the, and their arguments were these. The, the, suit, the lawsuit he brought was, uh, was too broad in scope. Uh, it mentioned all of the kernel versions you know, so McCarty said, "Oh, you got to stop shipping every kernel," and 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 said, "Well, there's kernel code, there's kernel versions that your code is not in, right? Going back, go back to two X or three X um, kernels." And uh, he did not show that his these are these are again these are G, Genia Tech arguments. Uh, so I'm not saying whether the arguments are valid or not, but these are the ones they brought up. They that uh, McCarty did not show his commits fulfilled requirements for copyright protection. Uh, McCarty did not show which of his commits were used by Genia Tech. Uh, and they also made a big deal that McCarty is not following community norms uh, with regard to GPL revocation terms. And that he was approaching multiple, multiple companies for monetary gain, which was kind of against the community norms again. So that second to last one, the GPL revocation terms, was really, really interesting the way it got argued in court. Uh, because what Genia Tech argued was that uh, under the GPL license, McCarty did not have the right to uh, to revoke uh, their license, because the GPL says you have to you have to provide your code under the GPL license, and so the, they said it was kind of a legal detail, but they said he can't revoke it the way he's revoking it, and uh, so that actually uh, came up. It was an interesting an interesting argument. Um, so if you look at this, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're at all involved with uh, GPL compliance, there are some interesting lessons for this. Uh, one is if, you're in, if you get served in Germany uh, by Patrick McCarty, whatever you do, just don't sign blindly the cease and desist declaration. Uh, it's worth it to, to mount a legal defense. Uh, obviously, you should make sure that you have GPL compliance. You should. Uh, do everything in your power to make sure that you are complying with the licenses, but you can prepare a legal defense strategy, and in particular the Genia Tech arguments uh, seem like they're pretty good ones and, and uh, may be useful uh, for people who uh, get um, get involved uh, with Patrick McCarty on his suit. Uh, the community uh, is, was very, actually very, followed this case with a lot of interest. So they, they don't like the way Patrick McCarty is going about it, but they're very, very, um, they're very, very concerned that, uh, that, that we still have proper legal enforcement. They don't want to give up the ability to uh, enforce the GPL. So uh, they don't like this particular lawsuit, but that doesn't mean they don't like all lawsuits. And uh, they, they do want to still enforce the GPL and, and have people comply with the GPL. Anyway. There's some there's some resources there at the bottom of the page you can see to uh, to look at for uh, some of this stuff. In particular, that blog uh, was by Harold Walty, who did a lot of GPL enforcement, so it's very informed. Uh, last thing, oh no, not second to last thing. Community issues. There were complaints about abusive maintainers in the Linux community. Uh, this is an issue that got raised at LinuxConf Australia. I gave a talk at ELC about maintainers and how to handle negative communication. If you're interested in that, uh, there's a talk, The Maintainer's Paradox, that I gave. And, uh, you can see the, the video for that online. 
Linux Foundation tab is actually looking at this issue. We've been working on a kernel developer's guide. And usually, the documentation in the kernel just covers technical issues, uh, but this one actually covers some social issues as well. And so, uh, hopefully, that will get released in the next little while, and we'll be able to uh, uh, improve uh, the community communication. So, that would be a good thing. Uh, and then, this is just in the way of industry changes, a little bit of a weird note. So, Intel is selling Wind River. Uh, not sure exactly what this means for the Octo project, uh, because uh, I think Wind was the main one that was kind of sponsoring that. Intel has discontinued their Edison, Galileo, and Joule lines, which was kind of their stake into the maker space and into the IoT space. So, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't. I don't know a lot about Intel strategy, but this is kind of interesting development, the, the kind of a change in the industry. We'll see what happens. Um, for this talk, I use uh, the following resources, uh, and you can find out all kinds of good information from LWN.net. Uh, I use kernel newbies to get some of the information about the different kernel releases. Lately, I've been using a lot of Foronix uh, stuff. So Foronix is a pretty good site. They're not really geared towards embedded, but they end up having a lot of interesting information about what's going on with the kernel. Uh, their, their coverage of the Linux kernel and per particular benchmarks and performance and power management is, is really good. And then the eLinux wiki uh, is a really great place to go, especially for the slides and videos. So if you miss something, the great thing about uh, embedded Linux conference and the Jamborees is you can always go back and find the slides and uh, look up material on the topic uh, that's interesting to you. And so with that, I will uh, thank you for your time and, and ask you if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Tim. Um, this is just for information for you guys. Tim Bird is coming to the uh, Linux uh, Open Source Summit Tokyo so that you will have a chance to talk with him directly. As well as that, uh, he is going to have the Japan Mini Jamboree talking about the Fuego at the, uh, you know, second, uh, at the uh, next day of the uh, final day of the uh, 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 Open Source Summit Tokyo. Uh, the venue is quite close to the uh, uh, Otaiba uh, Conference Center, so that you will be able to find it out quite free, uh, quite easily. So, if you have any question, please raise your hand, and I will pass the microphone because the uh, audio is captured by from this speaker, so that if you cannot speak loudly, he will not be able to listen to you. So, any question or discussion? Okay. Uh, is it really okay? <laughs> anyway, anyway, Timber, thank you very much, and have a good evening today. Um, okay. Done. Thank you very much. Thank have, you. Have a good rest of your day. Yep. So next. Uh,